Now, recently, I met Sir Clive Woodward, and again we were talking. I love meeting people outside of education, by the way. I think it's vital that we do that. We don't do it enough. We need to spend more time with people outside of our sector. That way we truly develop. So I was talking to him, and I said, tell me about how you did it. He said, well, I didn't really do anything. He said, but I'll tell you about a core philosophy, and it's one that really resonated with me. He said, when I took over the England rugby team, he said, I sat in my office, and I called in the players that were in the squad at the time, one by one, and I interviewed them. He said, now I brought in one young man, he said, who played in a particular position, and I did it with all of them, but I'll tell you about this young man. His name was Matt. He brought him in, and he brought him into his office, and Matt, who was an international rugby player, came in, and he was nervous because he was stood in front of the new boss, and the new boss, Clive, had got flip charts on either side of him, and he said, now, Matt, he said, I've analysed your performance, and on this flip chart here, I've ranked you as to where I think you rate in the country of people who play in your position. I've got the top 10 people, and I want to know where you think I rank you in the top 10 in this country. And Matt stood there like a naughty schoolboy, and he said, I don't know, boss, but I hope it's pretty high, because I think I'm pretty good. And he said, well, let me show you. And he put the flip chart back, and he said, in my opinion, in this country, you're the number one player in your position. And Matt stood there, and he went, thank you. He said, that's it, are you pleased? He said, yeah, I'm really pleased, thanks, boss. He said, are you really pleased? Yeah, I'm really pleased. Now, that's interesting, Clive said. Because on this flip chart, I've ranked the top ten players in your position in the world. Where do you think you rank on that list? He said, I don't know. And he pulled back the flip chart and he said, you rank number nine. And he said, this was the philosophy, Richard. Because I said to Matt that day, I said, Matt, in two months' time, we begin training for the World Cup, and I'm going to choose my players. He said, so here's what I want you to do. He said, I'm going to give you one month. And in that month, I want you to go away and analyze why I think you're the number nine in your position in the world. And then when you've worked out why I think you're the number nine in your position in the world, I want you to put together a training program that you think we can give you, me and my coaching staff, can work with you on to turn you from the number nine in the world to the number one in the world. You've got one month to do that for me. He said, okay, boss. And he went away. Ten days later, there was a knock on Clive Woodward's door. And he opened his office door and Matt was stood there. Ten days later, he said, boss, I've been away, I've done the analysis and I've put together the presentation on what I need from you and the coaching staff. Can I give you the presentation? And Clive said, so he sat down and he went through the presentation and I brought the coaching team together and he talked us through exactly what he needed in order to move from nine to one. He said, Matt Dawson, I knew that day would be the number one in his position in the world. He said, I'll tell you what's more. He said, half of the squad at the time, I kicked out. They never played for me again, even though they had more natural talent than half the other players in the United Kingdom's rugby squads. They never played for my squad. He said, because I'll tell you what that exercise taught me. He said, which I believe is the most important thing if you're to achieve excellence in anything. He said it's the ability to understand how to learn for yourself. Too many players, he said, in my squad were dependent on my coaches to tell them what they couldn't do and how they needed to get better. He said, I knew if I was going to have a team that could go onto a field and win a World Cup, that every one of the 15 players in my team needed to be able to analyse their own performance and understand what they had to do to improve it immediately. And as I finish my rant with you this morning, I would say that has to be our number one challenge. And again, as you sit and analyse your universities, and you think about the future, and you think about the qualities of your teaching staff, 
What we don't need are brilliant teachers who tell students stuff. What we need are teachers that have the skill to help our students learn for themselves. If our students can learn for themselves, they can become self-managers. If they can become self-managers, they have a chance of not just surviving, but thriving in the complexities of the 22nd century. And who knows, one of the students in your universities today could go on to become a person that finds the cure for AIDS or the solution for cancer. Could be somebody that goes on to discover the formula for world peace. Could be a future sports star that goes on to be the best in the world at what they do. Or a musician that goes on to write a piece of music that moves humanity. The point is, as we sit here today, we don't know which of our students those people are. But what we have to concentrate on doing is not delivering a system that we like, but that we deliver a system that truly empowers those young people to become the future of not just our neighbourhoods or the Philippines, but the future for humanity. What a great gift and challenge we have before us. Thank you very much indeed. Because we always go to the systemic level first. What's the structure? What's the system? Let's implement that everywhere. And that's the biggest mistake we make as human beings. When you look at successful organisations, whoever they are, in the 21st century. None of them are systems focused. They're all about process, they're all about evolution, and they're all about developing a culture of action research. And that's what I think is key to how we can implement a series of principles uniquely across a national vision. Thank you, here's a gentleman. Uh, thank you, sir. My point of concern is the greatest challenge among us presidents of colleges and universities. Sir, in, in, in the Philippine setting, the reality is that you have the high cost of education, of running a school, whether colleges or universities, because you have to satisfy the interests of the owners who would like to have savings, cost reduction measures in order to survive and to have more or less a reasonable uh, net returns. But actually, you are confronted with the challenge of increasing, satisfying the demands of faculty members and staff for more economic, increased economic benefits, plus the demands of the students for more modern facilities. Our problem is where sources have come, comes from tuition fees and other miscellaneous expenses which are also regulated by CHED and other uh, authorities. Now, my point of concern is how can you apply that empowerment that you have cited in your illustration that could be applicable to our current situations of how to run and manage a school as a president of okay. college or universities. Can you share to us? Sure. What, what shall we do? Yeah, oh gosh, there's a, there, what can we do, Richard? You tell us the answer. Um, I'll tell you that a number of things that you raise I think are really important. The first is innovation costs nothing, actually. There's such a mis- you know, almost we use it as an excuse sometimes not to innovate. The transference and development of human potential of empowerment doesn't cost anything. Just to give you an example, you know, at our little school, um, my budget was the most cost effective in the country, yet what we were doing was by far the most radical. Um, also, our staff retention was massive. We didn't pay any more money than any other school did. We were a state school, we had to pay the fixed salaries. But every time we had a vacancy, we had over 200 applicants for every post in our school. Not because of the money or the resource, but because they knew they were going to work somewhere dynamic, exciting, and where they were professionally empowered and, and valued. Um, also for me, the really important thing, and it is a dichotomy, and I can't give you the answer, but I think it's about courage and leadership, actually. You know, there are so many stakeholders who, as, if you like, the senior person in, in an education organization, we're accountable to. But what people have to realize and respect, that if your primary focus isn't on your students, your primary customers, your organization will go broke. If you think about commercial organizations, if they just focused on shareholders and managers and the people in the company, rather than focus 
on what the customer needed and wanted and the customer stops buying the product. You could have the best structured management system, the most lucrative pay in the world, your company will go bankrupt. And so for me, it's about courage. It's about an understanding that if you invest in the climate and environment of where you're working, people will want to work for you no matter what. You know, it's very interesting that CNN, about 10 years ago, did a major survey into job satisfaction. And the findings were explosive. Because what they did was they went around hundreds of major US companies saying, what are the main causes for job dissatisfaction? And they anticipated that salary would be in the top two or three. When the survey was produced, the, the salary was the tenth most important reason for job dissatisfaction. Number one, and clearly number one, was the inability of the leadership to show vision in practice in a sustained way. So for me, as president, my suggestion would be, and I know it's not some great huge answer, is that you have to focus on being the keepers of the vision. You have to be the people that drive that vision into practice. And as the leader, you have to have the courage to make sure that you don't allow your focus to drift from that core purpose. And if you hold on to that core purpose and you drive that vision into value, then actually all those other facets around you will take care of themselves. And if you have stakeholders that are still complaining, then they've got the problem, not you. Richard, maybe I, I can ask a question. That I, or clap, clap, clap. Don't hesitate. <laughs> they, they, they're hesitating. They're, yeah. they're shy. Yeah, uh, maybe it's a question on, everyone else, on everyone's mind because we, uh, everyone runs a, a university or a college, uh, which also might face similar problems like Grange did. We're, we're coming from a low-performing situation. But, you know, uh, just your ideas, I mean, Converting a Disneyland for 7 to 11 year olds is very different for creating a Disneyland for 18 to 22 year olds. So if you are in a higher education, well, okay, okay. If, but if you're, if you're in a higher education institution, what would the translation be for, for a college or university? Okay, first of all, I'm 46 years of age and I want to go back to Disney more than my children do. Um, <laughs> The really important thing for me, again, are the principles, right? Th there's no reason, one thing that, that any education organization can work harder at doing is creating learning experiences that are rich in context. So rather than having a lecturer stood at the front of a room with 50, 60, 100 students telling them stuff, it's designing learning experiences where the students are deeply interactive. You know, one of the reasons for the rise in, in online learning and particularly the blended classroom, is because what that's actually done is transferred control to the students. Students choose what, how, when, what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. And for me, it's at the core of it is that sense of empowerment. So in the higher ed institutions, there's the principles and the challenge is the same. How do you create an environment where traditionally we have experts and professors that stand and share their knowledge? How do we create environments which are more about that experiential learning? Because as was said in the previous keynote, you know, all evidence will show that the most powerful learning is learning that you've experienced for yourself. How do you stimulate the senses in that learning experience? How do you stimulate touch and sound and smell and sight and all of those other things as well? And of course, that's what Disney does so well, and that's what's so powerful about the greatest learning. And whilst you wouldn't want your kids necessarily building a town and pretending to run it, the principles of that contextual and experiential learning are exactly the same. How that looks like in a higher ed institution is up to the experts who work in higher ed, but it's those principles that I think can make the difference. Okay, I have time for one more question, please. It's open, go ahead. Okay, I just want to thank the speaker. You know, I've been in education for, I forget how many years, but I started with preschool education. I met John Holt, and you know, one of my heroes of the 60s. And uh, I thought, you know, you have managed to reignite that fire within me. The idea that there should be joy in education. And as presidents, you know, and uh, school leaders, we only have so much time, our plates are full, what should we do? It's people building. I have found that out. 
You know, and when I go to our basic education, I see, I spot principals, I spot people, you know, that's the most that I can do. I look around, I sit around, I listen to classes and so on, and I see people with great potential who seem to have that fire within them, who believe in developing the children, not the, the books and the, the syllabus and so on, but really learning going on in their classroom. So those people I try to put into positions of influence it's really people building in the end. Again, it's people building and really having that critical mass within the school that believe and share the vision with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. But that really wasn't the question. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I loved it anyway. It was yeah. wonderful. So shush. <laughs> oh, okay. So again, I have room for one more question. Just one. Just one yes, over. the gentleman in blue, please. There's a microphone here. Uh, yes, uh, I really appreciated the, the talk that you gave. Uh, I came back to my hometown grade school, Alma Mater, uh, 10 years ago uh, to help out and, and hopefully reverse uh, a situation that is uh, more than uh, uh, happy. Uh, but sadly, even with all the optimism and, and idealism that I, I have, up until now, uh, I feel like uh, we have not uh, succeeded as of yet. Uh, yes, we're trying to change. Uh, we're, uh, I'm trying to bring in the progressive paradigm uh, into our local school in Santa Cruz, Laguna. And uh, we've met uh, so many oppositions, uh, even from parents. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, is there a way to uh, change the way we assess uh, how the kids have learned? Because uh, uh, I, 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 I think uh, we're, uh, we're happy with how, how the, uh, the activities in our school have made the uh, school for our students uh, happier. But then again, at the end of the day, we're going to have to comply with, with all the uh, the tests uh, that uh, they need to pass. And then uh, one of my observations is that I know that the students have learned, but then when it comes to answering exams, uh, uh, I just feel like uh, exams are not uh, the on shouldn't be the only way by, by which we can assess the learning that the students actually is able to uh, to absorb, but then is there any other way <laughs> other than giving exams? <laughs> yeah, there, there are. I mean, very quickly, there are. Um, maybe we can talk afterwards and we can have a more detailed conversation. There are. Number of things. Firstly, if any organization focuses solely on its outcomes, it will never deliver to its potential. It will only ever deliver to its targets. It fascinates me that we live in a target-driven culture. If you have a target-driven culture, people, it's human nature, will work to that target. What you want is a, cr a culture where people can look beyond those targets. The biggest mistake at my school was we kept, fo you know, before I came, everyone focused on the exam results. What we didn't do was we forgot actually it was all about the quality of the process. So what we had to do, pardon me, was shift our assess assessment away from it being about just waiting for the exam and actually to an assessment of the process about the assessment of the evolution of children. And also, we had to create an assessment system that was much harder than exams. Let's be honest about this. Policy makers through generations have stuck with the exam module. Because essentially, to put no finer point on this, policy makers are lazy. True. Exams are easy. They are an easy way to assess. They are useless, by the way. They don't really examine how skilled somebody is. And companies now are uh, you know, showing that. People with top class honors degrees can't get jobs. People that have never been to university can, because it's about attitudes. It's about attitudinal development, right? So what we have to do is, yes, we still have to play the game. But what we have to focus on is developing an assessment system based on what is important, what we value. 
Resilience, perseverance, risk-taking, creativity, curiosity. Now, you can't measure... This is why these things aren't valued by policymakers, because you can't get somebody to take an exam in curiosity, right, and grade it out of 100%. What you can do is observe the development of a child who can increasingly show curiosity or perseverance and risk-taking. So what you do is you start with a baseline and you say, all right, what does somebody that has no perseverance look like? What does somebody who is an expert in perseverance look like? And what would the stages look like in between? And let's create observational assessment to assess where our students are and therefore what they need next to move further up. Now, it's much more complex, it's much more time intensive, but it's much more important and it's much more real. And if we focus on those things, we'll develop kids who will thrive in the future. I hope that's a little help anyway. Richard, uh, this is your first time in the Philippines? It is, yes. Okay, I so hope it's not my last. Is it going to be his last time? Someone just might say yes. I really like that. Yeah, so I heard that. that. A big yeah, risk. Okay. Yeah. But uh, before we go, Richard, some last, let's say, last thoughts that uh, you, you might share with the group before we end your session. Gosh, what can I say that I haven't already said in the overlong time you've given me to speak to you? Um, I think it's this. I think it's very simple, and I go back to what I said right at the beginning. Do not skip the opportunity that you have built here today. Promise yourselves that this collaboration will continue, that the partnership now between public and private sector and between the variants of organizations here, you will promise yourselves to wed together and build a dialogue a, on what the vision for the future can be, and B, what the critical principles are going to be that will keep binding us together. And then most importantly of all, do not be selfish about your successes. Be prepared to share them with one another. Be prepared to learn from one another. Forget our egos, it's not about us, and I'll finish with that thought. It is not about us, it is about our children and their future. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Richard Gerver.